Welcome to Harlow on Healthcare. I'm David Harlow, and I invite you to join me by my virtual hearth as I sit down with healthcare leaders to discuss building the future of healthcare. Today, my guest is Callum Yakubian. He is at Linguomatics at Acuvia, where he's Director of Healthcare Strategy. And we will talk today about artificial intelligence and natural language processing and their applications in the healthcare payer and provider transparency realm, particularly as that relates to risk adjustment. Callum, thank you for joining us. Hi, David. Thanks. Thanks very much for having me. And those sound like great topics of conversation and happy to touch on all of them and see where the conversation goes. Very good. Stepping back from the details of use of AI in healthcare, use of NLP in healthcare, in the world at large today, there is so much discussion of artificial intelligence in the context of the promotion of chat GPT and other online tools that are made available generally. Mm -hmm. Is part of the same spectrums, the same realm of things that you're working with. Some analysts speak of chat GPT as being susceptible to, quote unquote, hallucination, if you will, or urging people to not trust the machines so much as no matter how human they may seem, they're not all that human and perhaps not trustworthy. Does that same kind of question pertain to the uses in the healthcare realm, in the healthcare management realm that we're talking about here, or are we on more solid ground? No, I think a lot of the conversation that's bubbled up around ChatGPT has relevance for AI in many spheres, and I can say that with more certainty in healthcare, as it's the area in which I have my expertise. And I think the conversations have really thrown into the spotlight both the huge potential, but also the pitfalls and peril of artificial intelligence. And I think it's a great thing because it has brought what has been in many ways, a relatively niche subject right into public discourse. And I think it's great. And I think what we're seeing is a lot of the potential across industries. There are so many, for want of a better word, cool examples of people coming up with applications using these technologies that otherwise wouldn't have been able to and thinking of many different applications. And we're seeing that in healthcare as well. And what's interesting is there's a real mix of stuff that is new but also areas where we're seeing, oh, could we use this chat GPT technology, large language model technology to solve problems actually that we know are already very well solved by other forms of existing kind of AI technology, such as natural language processing. So I think it's, it's an awesome debate and it's thrown our area of the world or area of work right in the spotlight. So it's all a good thing, I think. Right. One of the most amusing discussions that I've seen online recently was around the idea of using an LM to write a request for a prior authorization from a plan. So a physician proposed using the tool to write a stock PA request to a health plan. And yeah. my thought was, gee, let's peel back the onion a couple layers. Why are we requesting PAs in this day and age? Couldn't something get under the hood at the payer's office to figure out, you, you don't need to look for a PA in this case because everything is, quote unquote, according to whole yeah, I've seen that. I've seen other that. kinds of applications that we're not even talking about. Yeah, I've seen that example. F funnily enough, I recently just wrote a blog on my perspective as a clinician on what chat GBT meant for healthcare rather than my perspective as like an informatician or a technologist. But that is exam an example that I quoted. I think it's very interesting. And I think that type of task, the, the discussion around generative AI using software technology to support in the creation of relatively menial tasks like document creation like that, whether it's a prior auth, whether it's something else in healthcare, if you can feed something like ChatGPT with sensible input, then I think, yeah, it's going to create huge efficiencies. But to your point, 
you know, where else in the revenue cycle, which I think we're not going to ever get away from in, in US healthcare, certainly not anywhere soon, could these types of technologies have impact? And technologies like natural language processing are already being used, whether that's in clinical documentation improvement to prevent claims denials, to support that there is medical necessity that needs for a prior authorization. There is already widespread use of technology, of AI technology like NLP in those spaces. And I think that's, again, going back to my earlier point, it's really interesting, the conversation that is arising, much of the potential value is already being realized with other types of AI. They've just not been in the spotlight because with ChatGPT, you can ask it to write a poem, including your daughter's name, so you have something nice to give her on her birthday. There are so many accessible uses for everyone, but the technology is now in so many people's hands. So yeah, I think it gets yeah, the, the humanization of it all is a brilliant marketing approach. Yeah. So digging deeper into the stack, so to speak, tell me more about where AI and NLP sits in the applications that you're using. We have been using natural language processing technologies in the healthcare and life sciences space for over 20 years. And over that 20 years, we've been you know, always looking to use a hybrid approach using the best of all the different methodologies that have come within natural language processing. So that means we use basic rules, we use rich ontology approaches, we use machine learning approaches, and we use language model approaches of which chat GPT or GPT-4 are just newer, bigger versions of. And critical to everything we've done in healthcare has always been the absolute need for transparency, because when you're using AI to support in decision making or you're using it for critical administrative tasks, it's absolutely important that you can trust the technology. And that, that was came back to your earlier point. And that's been central to what we do. And we have many applications over those years. And we're seeing just now we're doing a lot of work, for instance, in processes such as risk adjustment, because there's such a need for manual review of records. And with recent changes from CMS, there's, it's extremely important that you get it right as a payer organization. And yeah many areas, and I guess you mentioned at the start of risk adjustment, we could talk more on that if you'd like. Yes. So historically, risk adjustment has been an area that's been rife with potential abuses, and there's been a lot of litigation and appeals. Mm -hmm. And I guess the question is, do the tools that you're using, that you're offering, offer a safe harbor, so to speak? Is there an opportunity here to ensure both for the payers and for the government agencies that this risk adjustment is at some level more trustworthy, more accurate than what they've seen in the... Yeah, I certainly think so. So the way that you use AI in the kind of document review or the medical record review for risk adjustment is that you're trying to remove the burden of reading multiple documents to find relevant clinical information. All of the clinical information is in medical records. They are very right, which low these many years later is still mostly unstructured data, right? Oh yeah, still 80% of it is unstructured. The idea of using natural language processing is you put the relevant information in front of the expert, who is the clinical coder, and you present, you use the AI to present the information that they would naturally look for. So one of the key kind of tenets of that is presenting a diagnosis, say congestive heart failure was documented, and then presenting alongside that or doing having a way of seeing alongside that the relevant supporting clinical documentation that's needed in risk adjustment. So that's documenting, oftentimes the meet criteria is used so that the condition was monitored, evaluated, assessed, and treated. So in the instance of, say, congestive heart failure, it's showing the reviewer that not only did the clinician write the patient presents with chest and heart failure, they've also written that they assessed the patient for hitting edema, they ordered a chest x-ray for to check for pulmonary edema, and that they increased the patient's furosemide. So all of those things together mean that is codable diagnosis under the risk adjustment ruling, or the risk adjustment rules. So when payers or providers actually are using this technology, they know that when they are submitting codes, they are... If they're using the technology properly, they're only submitting codes that have substantiating evidence. Now, the challenge, and you mentioned a lot of the litigation, I work from a standpoint that not everyone's trying to be fraudulent, but that when you're audited, it's very hard to prove that you're coding properly. 
because someone reviewed a chart and they pulled out a diagnosis. And unless you have kept that chart highlighted with why you pulled it out, it's very hard to go back and say why you coded the person as you did. If you're using technology, when it comes to an audit, you have a complete uh, electronic paper trail of why your coders submitted certain codes and that, the, and that for the code they submitted, there was substantiating evidence. So yeah, I think it safeguards the payers and lets them have a degree more of certainty in how they're coding and also lets them audit it internally and be ready for when an external audit comes. And without necessarily getting into to too many details, or if you can't speak to it, I understand, has your technology withstood audit? Audit. We, uh, yeah, as far as I am aware, and we provide our technology to our clients to use self-sufficiently without necessarily uh, needing us to hold their hands. As far as I'm aware, no. As far as I'm aware, it hasn't. There hasn't been a situation in which one of our clients using it have been audited. But I honestly, I do not know the answer to that. Understood. And so, you mentioned that the stakes are higher under a recent new rule and i will ask you in just a moment to get into that a little deeper but first if you're just tuning in this is harlow on healthcare coming to you on healthcare now radio i'm david harlow and my guest today is Callum yakubian director of healthcare strategy at acuvia's linguomatics so Callum. We're talking about the issue of using AI and NLP in the context of risk adjustment. And we're talking about risk adjustment in the context of some relatively recent CMS regulations. And I'm wondering if you could describe how the regulation changes the playing field. Yeah, so there, in, the, in the past few years, there have been a number of cases or litigations in cases where there have been findings of what is sometimes called upcoding or kind of incorrect coding or essentially coding of diagnoses that didn't exist in a given encounter, but have been previously there. And the, the, these kind of lawsuits have signaled this change in the mood from CMS, which has been outlined in the new RAD v final rule that essentially increases the severity of penalization for whenever an audit is done and the uh, if it is found within that audit uh, that there has been coding that hasn't been substantiated. So the penalizations, or the, I guess, have increased in severity and have much larger impact, financial impacts on any organization that has been found to be claiming for conditions that the auditors don't find to be substantiated or don't find to exist. And a big part of that is this: is they talk about unsupported diagnosis codes. You essentially have to pay back any payment that you had for any for those unsupported codes. And that's me going back to the piece I was saying previously. It's not okay just to code the patient as having congestive heart failure because it says the patient has been presented with congesting heart failure. You absolutely have to have found evidence that was a monitor assessed, evaluated and treated condition, which is why technologies such as natural language processing are becoming more and more common in the risk adjustment process. So is there a danger of over-resourcing patient care in order to document a diagnosis? I mean, overstaffing, essentially, if there's all this extra documentation that's needed that's not for care, but it's for justifying risk adjustment, right? Is there an overhead here that we're adding to the system that Maybe we don't really need. No, I I think the entire arrangement of risk adjustment is within the model of a value-based care arrangement. So at its ethos, it's about preventative healthcare. So if carried out as it's intended by CMS, it should be increasing the health of the population and also ensuring that it's not that you're moving to a preventative care model where you're caring for a population rather than fee-for-service. This measure should really be if anything, it, is, it will be stopping the, any examples of where there is coding for conditions that don't exist. Right. Now, at the minute, the way that risk adjustment works is if a payer works completely alone without partnership with their providers, 
they may add codes where they don't necessarily need to share that incentive that uh, share that reimbursement back with the providers but increasingly payers need to work much more closely with providers to ensure that there is appropriate documentation that there's appropriate management and if you were asking is there going to be a chance that physicians start documenting stuff that doesn't exist? And I would obviously sincerely hope not. And I think under this type of arrangement, that's much less likely than under fee-for-service arrangements. And there, obviously, the point of the risk adjustment from the provider perspective is to ensure that resources are there to care for more complex patients. And from the payer perspective, it's to provide those resources so that even more complex complications can be. Exactly. Yeah. Hopefully everybody's pulling in the same direction here. And that's really the challenge of the value-based care systems. And there are naturally different approaches to designing payment models in the value-based care arena that may do better or not as well in aligning incentives. In the context of risk adjustment or maybe beyond the context of risk adjustment, are there any of the Medicare or other value-based payment models that you're able to point to as being better on this spectrum, right? Some things are going to incentivize, are going to work better at incentivizing the things we want to incentivize, right? So I guess the question is the jury still out or do we know what's working yeah that is a big and difficult question i am very much in favor of value-based care arrangements and i'm very much in favor of the more widespread adoption of metrics outside of your traditional clinical indicators being used in kind of healthcare reimbursement and in the kind of incentivizing of care so I think when I'm saying that, I'm thinking very specifically about social determinants of health. And I'm watching very closely, for instance, the developments that we're seeing now under the ACO REACH program, where providers that have signed up to ACO REACH have to be demonstrably identifying and treating social determinants of health under the payment terms of that plan, which I think is a great thing, because I think we have seen over the last couple of years that there is a huge impact on a patient's outcome and on the health of a population that is determined by their social determinants of health. And I think tying them into payment models is a great idea. And I guess thinking, tying that back to technology and AI, that's an area that we have done a lot of work in is screening all of that unstructured data we talked about before for kind of clinician documented social determinants of health. And nurses and doctors often capture social history and technology allows you to surface that. And we're finding that Compared to structured data, you have up to 300 times richer social determinants of health history presented when you use natural language processing versus when you use the Z codes that are mandated but very poorly filled in a hospital. Sure, because no one has the patience to actually do that. Yeah, it's one thing asking, yeah, it's one thing dictating the patient came in by bus or the patient lives alone. That happens a lot in social history. But then sure. going and putting it in as a structured field does not happen nearly as often. Yeah, that's yeah one of the one of the great challenges of the rollout of digital health records and one of the great opportunities for a company like yours. Uh, yeah, to, to to mine that data and social determinants, of course, account probably for a higher percentage, so to speak, of the outcomes for people than the quote unquote, medical care, health care that's being delivered through yeah. provider organizations. So being yeah. cognizant of that is, is critical. Yeah. And I think it's great to see I think the ACO reach model. I think I like the ethos of that really tying in those social determinants as part of the overall delivery of care for patients and populations. Callum, what else is of importance to healthcare organizations? that are thinking about using tools such as these if they haven't dipped a toe already? Yeah. So I think most organizations now, particularly on the provider side, are wanting to have a really solid understanding of what it is they're going to get out of adopting technology over 
50% of healthcare CIOs talk about wanting to adopt AI technology, but the rate of uptake is lower than that. So demonstrating some type of return on the investment in the technology, and that doesn't have to be a financial return on investment, but maybe reduced waiting times, it may be increased understanding of disease burden to support population health plans. I think no matter what the application is, what's very important beyond that is that it's understandable, transparent. And if you have those two things and it's accurate, then it's trustable. And you touched on that in the intro. You, we have to be able to understand and we have to what the, what the systems are saying and we have to understand what the reasoning was for why it suggested a patient, for instance, as a social determinant risk factor. And yeah, those, as I said earlier, those are guiding principles of everything we do in healthcare. And they are some of the challenges that are posed by some of the areas that we're seeing a lot of hype in at the minute. Tom, you described AI in healthcare as being in the background, so to speak, and the work that you've done over a period of, of, of 10 years or longer. So where do you expect to see this bubble up into the broader consciousness next in the healthcare realm? So we're talking about risk adjustment today. Where else does this stand to be of greater importance in the future? I think that one of the key areas that, that we'll see AI used much more in is clinical decision support and in early diagnosis and actually prevention of conditions. An area I'm really passionate about, for instance, is rare disease and the diagnostic odyssey that we hear of. It takes eight years to diagnose someone with a rare disease. Seeing artificial intelligence used in that diagnostic process, shortening that time for diagnosis and not just rare disease, but other disease, I think is an area that there's a lot of really interesting work already under one such area using natural language processing for deep phenotyping, for instance, to go alongside genomic testing. I think that's one area. I think thinking further forward, I think it's undoubtable that AI in some way will, will form more and more of a part of daily of everyday medicine. And more and more AI tools will be used by a greater and greater proportion of the kind of the clinical population. I think that's just, that is inevitable. And I think just on that point, I think we're seeing the narrative change a little bit from artificial intelligence to augmented intelligence. I think artificial intelligence isn't going to replace medics and clinicians, but those who use AI are going to replace those who don't. And I can't take credit for that. That is a quote from The Lancet from last year, and I can't remember the author, but it's one that I really like. Yeah, so I know people have said variations of that over the years when people thought that we wouldn't need radiologists in the future. It's no, yeah. the machine is not going to replace the radiologist, but the radiologist who uses technology to the max will replace the radiologist who doesn't. I think that's just, just one example of the broader statement that you're yeah. You suggest. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We see this as an opportunity to enhance the abilities of all of the contributors to the healthcare system, whether clinical or administrative. Yeah. And I think you see a bit more of it happening on the administrative side at the minute, because bluntly, that's where where you see the kind of financial impacts within areas like the revenue cycle. But as AI becomes more trusted and more expert in the kind of data that's been used there, I think will become more and more used on the clinical side. Great. Thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. You have been listening to Harlow on Healthcare. Join us at healthcarenowradio.com. Let's continue the conversation on building the future of healthcare together at hashtag Harlow on HC. I'm David Harlow, keeping the fire going and holding a seat open for you. Until next time. <laughs>